Moving on, we have another thought-provoking panel session uh, on continuous disruptive innovation. For this, I would like to invite on stage Dr. Pawan Soni, founder Inflection Point Consulting, Ms. Deepa Bachu, co-founder and CEO at Pensa Design, Mr. Niladri Ray, VP Engineering and Country Head for India at Flexera, Mr. Vivek Pandyarajan, Head of Technology at Swiss Ray, and to moderate this session, I would like to invite Malti S, Consultant Chief Product Officer at Jobs for Her. A big round of applause to the panel. I'm excited to be here to host this uh, uh, fantastic panel over here. All right, so my name is Malti, and i um, happy to moderate this session here. So as the topic goes here, right, we talk about continuous disruptive innovation, right? So just to kind of get a little warm up, I'm going to kind of go around and ask each of these leaders that when you think about continuous disruptive innovation, what is the first product, first brand that comes into your mind? Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, I'll probably use this opportunity to, you know, sell our own product, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, it's it's actually a very fascinating product. We built it a uh, few months ago, and uh, so when uh, I'm sure most of you know, uh, a very major hurricane hit Florida. Uh, few uh, weeks ago, and uh, the uh, damage estimates are significant, significantly, you know, high. And uh, so, but, you know, we actually had a very cool uh, product that right from Bangalore, uh, we were able to sit here and monitor the storm uh, even before it was actually hitting, uh, because we had the models as part of Swiss Re, and, uh, and the interesting part was uh, when actually the the damage has happened. Uh, so we were able to do a pre and a post assessment of the damages because you have aerial images. And uh, so using machine learning or artificial intelligence on image images, uh, we were able to predict the damages. Uh, the the uh, essence of it all comes down to when uh, when uh, the customers, you know, so it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's normal for a customer to go through a claim and file a claim. Right, but uh, we actually touched many lives because there were customers who actually had not filed claims, but we knew they should be filing claims because we can see it, right? So it gave us an opportunity to actually knock the door, give, reach out to them and say, are you all right? Uh, so I think that was a very, uh, very uh, cool innovation that we did, so. Sure. Um, I didn't plan the PR activity that he just did, um, but I'm a big movie buff. I love movies. I'm a Bollywood junkie and everything, right? So for me, I think, um, you know, if you think about disruptive innovation, I think iteration is about doing the same things, but just better. Innovation is about doing new things, and disruption or disruptive innovation is about doing new things that make old things obsolete, right? So as a moviegoer, I think Netflix um, is, you know, a great example of disruptive innovation where they're doing new things that actually make old things obsolete, like going to a theater. Um, so yeah, that would be my quick response. Yeah, great one. Thank you. Dr. Pavan, do you want to go next? Sure. Thank you. So uh, when I was coming in, I saw this gentleman who had this mosquito racket. Is the person still around? The mosquito racket? So that's my example. Now, if you look at this uh, industry, the mosquito industry, for example, mosquito is the... Mosquito yeah? <laughs> now, if you go back in time, the first thing that we had was this uh, kachwa chhap coil. And I have seen so many tents getting burned down because of this kachwa chhap coil. So it was the first major move that happened. 
And then the Dabur came up with this Odomos. Odomos was a very interesting product because Odomos would not even repel mosquitoes. <laughs> you know, it would also repel fellow human beings. And if you, if you have ever smelled Odomos, even after a gap of 30 years, you'd be able to recognize that smell. And then we had those mats, the vapor mats. So you'll put the mat and then they will vaporize. Then we had the sprays, the hit, and more recently these vaporizers. Now the entire dominant paradigm or the dominant logic of this entire industry, whether it is Godrej, Sarali, or Racket Benkaiser, or Dabur, any of those players, was to repel the mosquito. Now in the year 1997, there was this Chinese chap who sitting in his uh, lab came up with this racket that we have seen only after 20 years of its invention. So what happened was that this way of electrocuting mosquito, we have always seen it happening. And where have you seen mosquitoes getting electrocuted? Canteens, restaurants, cafeterias, all of us have seen that. But what this gentleman brought in was he reduced the form factor from that B2B segment to a B2C segment. And none of the dominant players in the industry who were in the business of repelling mosquitoes ever thought about this product because they were stuck to the paradigm of repelling mosquito. And this guy said, I don't care what happens with the mosquito, <laughs> whether the mosquito is repelled or the mosquito is killed. I want to save my customer. And all of a sudden, we have this massive disruptive innovation. So the word disruptive, dictionary meaning of the word disruptive is, as Deva rightly said, is to destroy the dominant paradigm or the dominant logic. Equally important is for us to realize that when you have a disruptive product, you need a disruptive supply chain. Now, if you remember, the first time that you saw this racket was not at a shop. It was at the, where you first time see this, traffic signal. Right? Many of us, at least I saw it at the traffic signal. And there was this guy who was kind of uh, demonstrating it to us. And if it only moves from one traffic and survives till the next traffic signal, that should be it. Which means that the entire industry evolved around a new supply chain. Because you do not know how to place it. Should it go into a grocery store? Should it go into an electronic store? Should it go to a mom and pop store? Should it be sold at Amazon, Flipkart? Now, none of them knew what category it should come into. So it took some time before it got established, and today the market leader is a company called HIT. It's none of the other players, so they embraced it. So what happens with disruptive innovation is that it knocks the incumbents out of their steam. And it typically comes from the most unthought of era. So that is an example from a day-to-day -day usage, which I thought uh, you would be able to relate to the meaning of the word disruptive innovation. Wonderful one. I mean, very, very diverse and probably saving the best for the last. Ladri, over to you. That's some pressure. <laughs> <coughs> so my story, um, actually, you talked about touching lives and I, I want to talk a bit about it. The story goes like this. Uh, There's a young lady um, with PayPal, a very good job on product side and um, has this ambition, aspiration to venture into the unknown and handle the issue of infertility. Okay, Not the space that she's actually been doing for quite some time. And uh, you know, for a for a country that we are in, uh, she gets posed the questions from everybody who has got funds to invest. That uh, a billion plus people, why is infertility an issue? A, and B, who's everybody? You know, everybody's looking at the data, and you know, you don't even have reproductive health. You know, to look at it. So, this lady uh, doesn't decide to give up. Uh, she actually has multiple rounds of setbacks in terms of uh, finding even you know to move the needle, but flash story to present. Um, this lady today has got 30 million customers on her platform taking help on um, high-risk pregnancy and infertility support. Um, her business model in, in, in less than a year, she's generated enough that she had thought in her business plan would be uh, five years out. And just a couple of weeks back, she got the Woman of the Year Entrepreneur Award. So her name is Padmini Janaki. The reason I'm sharing it is I'm an angel investor in a firm, very proud of the story that has uh, happened. And now, what did she disrupt? She disrupted a paradigm that people actually even thought would not even happen, right? So, a uh, very inspiring story that I wanted to share overall. And uh, even as I speak right now, her, uh, the entire food chain from infertility to menopause is something that she has tracked down. And she now has uh, global attention from markets outside India who want to be on the platform. The name of the platform is Mind and Mom. Yeah, I know that. Thank you, Niladri, for sharing that. That's a big one.
All right. So I think all the example, very, very diverse set of examples, you know, somewhere we thought, looked about some business model innovation. Some of them was talking about purely product innovation, right, and getting into a venturing into a absolutely new market. Now, if you look at any organization which is very relevant and have done that decade after decade, I think one key aspect that is that, that they are customer obsessed, right? So for being innovation to drive and thrive in an organization, understanding your customer is a key aspect. Now, I would like to kind of go around this panel to ask that how do customer help drive innovation and how do you even look beyond that uh, to drive innovation in their organizations? Maybe I'll start with Deepa. Sure. Um, so I think, um, you know, being customer centered is really, really important. Now, the biggest myth around this is that customers will tell you what to do. That's not what it's about at all. It's about observing customers, understanding their deepest unmet needs, and then solving those deep unmet needs, what we call problem statements, right? Now, it's not enough to stop there as well. You want to understand how customers define success, not how you would define success, but how customers would define success. We call these customer benefit metrics. So what you want to do is be empathetic, be obsessed with customers, understand what they do, understand what they don't do, but really stop, don't stop till you ask the question why. So you understand customers better than they know themselves. That's the first place to start. Once you know that, you start to synthesize, connect the dots in interesting ways and say, you know, what might be that unmet need? And then design solutions around them. Now, one of the things that's really popular and I highly advocate for that is co-creating with your customers itself. It's actually funny, one of the first times I did the co-creation with customers, we ignored the customers. Like, we didn't want to hear what they had to say. And we started, you know, innovating and we said, we think the customer will do this and we think the customer will do that. So there are a lot of cultural nuances, like my, Amazon has the customer chair, reminders that I think we need to have that humility to say we want to test actively with customers and really be customer-centered. Again, this doesn't mean listen or ask the customer what they want. I think it was Henry Ford that said if I had asked customers what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. Um, you know, so it's not about asking the customer what they want. It's really about observing them and understanding what they're doing or not doing, why they're doing that, and then inciting the problem from there, the problem that you need to solve. So a lot of times it's about, I think, breaking out, you know, solving the right problem and then solving the problem right. The initial part is understand what's that right problem to solve and then go about designing those amazing experiences that customers are going to be delighted by. Absolutely, fantastic nuggets over there. Thanks, Deepa. Dr. Pavan, what, is, what are your thoughts? Any? Um... Yeah, so I'll pick up from Henry Ford. So the same Henry Ford also said that uh, you can get a car of any color you want as long as it is black. And 100 years on, we had another version of Henry Ford by the name Steve Jobs, and who said that uh, I would not ask what the customer needs, I will tell them what they want. So. I have a big reservation, though I'm a big proponent of design thinking, but I have a big reservation with these two words. The first is customer centricity, and the second is empathy. Uh, so, and what I want to advocate today is what, a new concept called bounded empathy. Here is bounded empathy. You check into your Indigo baggage, and the lady smiles at you. She hands over the boarding pass to you, and then you go through the airport security clearance. And then you are shopping in that area, trying to pick up a few books, trying to grab a bite. And just about the time you are landing onto your gate, you realize the gate is closed. And then you stand there demanding empathy. You don't get any empathy. Which means whatever empathy we're talking about has to be in the bounds of business logic. So what I want to advocate is that a happy customer does not always translate into a successful business. Three examples. Kingfisher Airlines, Jet Airways, Moza Bear. I've never met in my life an unhappy customer of Kingfisher. I don't know why. They spoiled the customers. And while spoiling the customers, they ran themselves into the ground. So what we need to advocate is that while empathy is very important, empathy also needs to be bounded. 
customer centricity is very important but we need to understand when to listen to the customer and when not to listen to the customer now we have spoken so much about when to listen to customer empathy maps tool methods etc but let me give you two cents on when not to listen to customer now 20 years back there was this very brilliant idea which remained at the stage of idea itself that we should have a non qwerty keyboard a non qwerty keyboard and you all understand the qwerty keyboard that we are used to come from the era of typewriters where they have spread out the commonly used uh, keys on either sides of the hand so that the ribbon doesn't get entangled there was a logic so when you are drumming the keys on the ribbon the ribbon and the keys should not get entangled that was the logic of qwerty keyboard but qwerty keyboard as it turns out had no scientific evidence to it more recently, uh, folks have invented something that a non qwerty keyboard would increase your typing speed by no less than 20% and would reduce your errors significantly. How many of us would be willing to trade away from a qwerty keyboard to a non qwerty keyboard given all the benefits? One. That's a good statistics. One, which is just about 0.3% of this audience. The point which I want to make here is customers have vested interest in the status quo. And as much as you as a seller would like the customer to embrace something which is new and exciting, customer would always want to remain there because the investments are high. So I think customer centricity may quickly lead to mediocrity also. And that's where the companies which are so much looking at the customers would be knocked down by the people who are looking at the non-customers. And that's what Clayton Christensen, who actually gave us the word in 1997 in his book, Innovator's Dilemma. So the biggest dilemma that we have as an innovator today is whom to listen to and when not to listen to. Whom to listen to, we have a lot of literature on that, when not to listen to. So quick hint, when you are trying to do something which is absolutely radical, where there is no precedence, don't listen to customer, listen to the technological trajectories. Like today also we do not know the applications of quantum computing. So that's technological trajectory. So that's called technological leapfrogging. But when you are seeking incremental innovation, you should listen to the customer. So that's what we call as punctuated equilibrium. So you have continuous innovations punctuated with breakthroughs. So that's the two cents on customer centricity. If I may just add, I don't think customer centricity is asking the customers or ignoring them. Mm -hmm. Customer centricity is to be customer obsessed, to understand what they are looking to accomplish, what is the outcome they're looking for, whether it's typing or otherwise. So it's not about listening or not listening to customers, or it's not delegating the responsibility as a product manager to say, okay, now customer, you tell me what needs to be done. Right, so I think that's a little different. And you know, I'm a big follower of Craig Christensen's work as well. And I understand the innovator's dilemma. It's about focusing on who has that problem. Um, you wanna look at you know, a set of customers. You wanna say, who has this problem? And you wanna go after everybody. You wanna make sure that that problem is deep and broad. So that's what Clay Christensen talks about. Uh, he does not talk about ignoring customers at all. Yeah, I think it, these are some great insights. And I, I think, you know, being a product leader, I think I kind of do the extraction of both. You know, we, whenever we talk about product management, there is one big Venn diagram where you will have customer on one circle, you will have technology on the other circle, and then you have the business. And I think as product builders, we take it back where we, you know, extract the best and make sure that what makes sense from a business perspective, from a technology perspective, and still gives values to the customer. So I think I kind of extract the best from all the all the three uh, avenues of it. So wonderful uh, insights uh, from both of you. I would like to now, you know, move into the the next segment of things, right? I mean, uh, we have kind of done great insights and paint a huge fancy vision where we say that uh, this is where we want to take our organization from here to here. This is what we are going to deliver. Now, if you do not have a strong delivery vehicle, if you do not have a strong model your plan is as good as you what you painted, right? And this is where I'm kind of going to go to Niladri and talk about two aspects. One is, what are some of those, you know, efficient delivery models that you would like to talk about? So on the delivery models, I'll just kind of uh, tie up to what uh, Deepa and Dr. Pawan spoke about. Uh, result economics and the innovation relay, you know, two things that I, I think are very important. 
See, at the end of the day, the innovation bit, uh, by and large, what everybody is used to are the incremental, and we call it the innovation. And that's kind of the result economics around the EBITDA, right? Uh, finally, in terms of what really has the quantum jump is on the ARR and new bookings, renewals. So on the innovation relay, uh, if you really look at what has changed around us and why is innovation relays, you know, a couple of years back, if you were setting up a company or a product, you would be very capex sensitive. You would actually have to have a site, infrastructure, you kind of capitalize it, and then you try to kind of have a very efficient opex layer. Now with things around us, A, COVID, and then B, all the SaaS platforms and cloud, the model has shifted to the opex uh, focus a bit. And uh, you are also in a stage right now when you do something, you don't, the three year, five year plan, you talked about technology trajectory, you don't even know who's gonna disrupt you in the, in the meantime. So business cases that are done, uh, essentially speaking, have to now uh, prefigure the OPEX versus the CAPEX at a higher priority, and be very sensitive to ARR, you know, from that point of view. So innovation really is more about what are you using around you to be able to make your OPEX post. Uh, I have one example I want to give, um, you know, a lot of examples on EBITDA on ARR. I represent a company that is uh, the underpinnings of the software uh, industry, um, and we've got a product called Install Shield. Install Shield is known by everybody. It's a market leader on application packaging and deployment. Market leader. What happened a few years back, and this has got nothing to do with you know the, the regular innovation, but it's a bit disruptive. So, what happened was um, we started seeing that a lot of competitors were hacking through the system, and a lot of pirated copies of Install Shield were out there, and users, and so on and so forth. And we were losing serious market share because, obviously speaking, you know it's, it's out there, pirated versions and all. The team uh, spent some time thinking, and uh, uh, we added a compliance intelligence. We already had that in the kitty. We added it to the kit. So now what happens is in the compliance intelligence kit, as you go out, anybody who's trying to crack your code, whoever is the final user, we get to know who's the final user. So rather than doing anything about what to do about piracy internally, we just simply converted the legitimate users to legitimate users. That's all we did. And suddenly from nowhere, the small delta that was done, small integration effort that was done, has had a non-trivial impact on our margins and our ARR, to the tune of 10% in one year. I don't want to get to how many millions out here. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation, it's a case study of kind of you know, drinking your own champagne and not you know, worrying about it. So uh, we did disrupt, and, but the important thing was result economics was very clear. We did not want to lose market share. We did not want to lose the renewal rates that we actually had on the platform. Yeah, thank you. That's a brilliant example in Adri. So Vivek, uh, as we, I mean, we kind of talked about disruptive innovation. Now, in any organization to stay ahead of their competition, as much as we would like to be continuously disrupting, coming up with new products, sustained innovation, I was hearing one of the panel today morning, is a very, very important aspect, right? How would, how would you look at it, balancing disruptive innovation versus sustained innovation? Sure. Uh so let me just give an example, right? So let's assume a firm doesn't have an innovation team or 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 bunch of people you know handling innovation, uh, or even innovation as a thought process, right? Uh, so when you put a team together, first thing people think about is they come up with a solution first. They have the solution, the answer ready, then they try to hunt the problem, right? So the first thing they want to pick up is all right. We have to do something with blockchain. Right, uh, you know that's that's the trend that was going on for the last two years, right? And uh, so, uh, what what we think has worked for us is a you know keep the customer in mind, uh, b you know do what pick a pick a problem that uh, you can sell, pick a problem that will be useful, and it does not need to be miles away. Right, so I think a session before this session spoke about integration. Uh, how uh, these days the product development is evolving uh, because you don't have the time. We don't have years now or even months to come up with a product. You accept and acknowledge that you're not good at certain things, but you're good at putting things together and you're good at uh, presenting it to your customer with your secret sauce, right? So that's so it could just mean taking those small steps. And I think that has worked for us. Like, 
As an example, at Swiss Re, we have a fairly large global innovation team. And when I joined the company, the first thing, when I sat in the first monthly sort of council, some of the things that were presented were like, really, that's it? You know, so this is it, this is what the team can come up with. But you know, as, as you start understanding the impact, right, the, uh, the product itself may not be that flashy or that fancy. Uh, so again, going back to your mosquito bat, right? If, uh, if somebody just, you know, lives in a country where mosquitoes are not a problem, say some parts of United States, let's say, and uh, you know, mosquito bat will not hold that much of a value, right? So it's not flashy, it's not, you know, fancy, but it solves a huge problem. So I think that's more realistic and uh, that kind of works. And it's also safe. Uh, what we also have taken a pledge is, if something doesn't work, kill it, right? So you don't want to be sitting with an expensive product where hundreds of people have invested time in it and innovated it, right? To, uh, to just because you have put in the investment. So I think these are safer bets for large companies where uh, you don't have a massive PE backing uh, you have to invest yourself. So these things, you know, work better for us, so. Yeah, I completely agree. In fact, one of my products, right, I mean, I remember just unchecking a default that was selected helped us move our NPS by a couple of points, <laughs> right? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not always about making big disruptive innovations, but making sure that customer is kind of taken care of, building those delightful, Small incremental ideas are a great way of going at it. Now, when we talk about you know uh, innovation, uh, there are definitely scale as we talk about the theme of the aspect today. That means we need to take our entire organization together with us, right? It has to be uh, whether it is a framework, toolkit, or just that mindset. It has to persist at every level within the organizations. So, my next question would be for all of you to understand that as leaders. How do you bring in that mindset change uh, to, your, to your teams? Deepa, maybe you want to start with it? Yeah, gosh, you know, mindset changes are the hardest to make, right? But I would say, um, you know, having clarity about what is that two state that you want to get to, but also having a lot of clarity on where you're, you are currently. Like, you know, you were talking about the innovations not being as uh, leapfrog as you had originally anticipated. So it's sort of understanding your from to, and I think the hardest thing really is unlearning that the organization has to do. So um, having the patience, um, you know, both you and I worked at Intuit, and the entire sort of customer obsession being in your DNA, it was a journey of almost four years, right? It takes time, it takes a few postage, uh, you know, poster children products that you can talk. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, innovation is extremely risky, right? I think um, the, the success ratio worldwide, you might know, but it's something that's significantly less than 1%. So um, as soon as you've decided to innovate or do something differently, the odds are against you. So I think the first thing as a leader is to understand where you want to go and where you are today. And a lot of us make the mistake of forecasting to say, you know, we're here, we want to be there. But an interesting technique that I've learned is actually called backcasting, which is you sort of say, no bars, where do we want to be? And then you start pebble hopping from that future to where you are today. And actually those pebble hops will be sequenced very differently. So I think um, unlearning, hardest challenge, um, but those few successes that you have gives the organization sort of that confidence that it can be done. Um, there are a lot of case studies that are outside of the company. So I, I think it's sort of a, a staged process where you first look for inspiration outside, and then you start to motivate that change to happen inside in small bite-sized chunks. You use those victories as a way to change the mindset but certainly backcast your way versus forecast it. 
Yeah, that's a wonderful way. And actually on that note, I remember Niladri in one of our conversation, you actually talked about it is not always about outside in, but also inside out. And I would love you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so <clears throat> my prior job, we were the underpinning of Wall Street, uh, running trillions of uh, defense play out there. And uh, very proud of this story. Uh, this um, inside out business is uh, started because we realized that um, Innovation seems to be like a C-suite discussion. You know, some people at uh, the top uh, will make decisions and then you execute because the market share said something. Um, so as part of a lot of effort, what we realize is finally, if you really have to move the needle, you've got to have a very collective force behind it. And every individual, the customer support person who's handling the call thinks that person knows what the issue is. The product manager who's on the roadmap wants that roadmap item to be done. The GM who's got the sale wants the thing to become a revenue, so you want to go agile. The engineer thinks, you know, all these guys do nothing. I'm the one who's going to be. So managing tension, I think, is a, big, is a big part of the whole process. So one of the things we did, and we did this over a multi-year process, which had fantastic results, is we tied up with uh, Edward De Bono. I'm a huge proponent of uh, his six thinking hats and rattle thinking tools. But what it does is to manage tensions is you know, if you put an engineer and a product guy and um, it must be my idea versus your idea versus this idea. But in parallel thinking, everybody is thinking about how could this work? or how it does not work, black hat, green hat, white hat, and so on and so forth. And there are techniques to invert the idea. So I just spoke about the whole install shield example. You know, rather than thinking about a product, just think about how do you convert your legitimate customer. There's a provocation movement. So we put a lot of uh, emphasis on that, and we ensured that on the ARR discussion, we had SMEs, she had one in the room, Shalini is sitting out here, who we were able to ensure that when people come up with ideas, we were able to take that into a narration, which had the ROI very clear on the IRR over a three-year journey. So you know where you're going to move the needle and, and the sponsors vote in terms of investment. So we were able to put those disciplines at a global level. And I can tell you we had stories where in which an idea that germinated in, in Vancouver was able to get us a sale in Southern Australia. And an incremental idea in India was able to get us a new customer in Germany and you know, result in platform wins. We had a thousand plus revenue generating ideas of the firm and Google wanted to buy the platform. We said no. But long story short is we realize that you know, having everybody as part of the ecosystem, longer process, but you get far more victory in the end versus having it as a boardroom discussion and having point-based hackathon efforts. Wonderful. Shared vision and having a skin in the game. <laughs> Wonderful. Dr. Pavan, I know that you kind of also conduct a lot of workshops uh, around this. Uh, so how do you enable that? So uh, before I come to that, I just wanted to clarify one thing about incremental innovation. Incremental innovation is not incremental results. That's very important to understand. An idea may be incremental, but the result can be exponential. Just to give you a perspective, there was a research conducted by BBC and The Economist in the UK. In the last one century, which has been the most important invention? Before I tell you the answer, I would like to solicit your view. What, according to you, is the most important invention in the last 100 years? OK. OK. Steam engine happened before that, but still. Internet steam engine. Go ahead. Intellectual property, you said? Electricity, OK. Anything else? So the answer, answer which I'm going to give you is so counterintuitive, and that's where the question comes from. The most important invention of the last 100 years is fertilizers. Fertilizers. Just to give you a perspective, when BBC wrote it down, I just quote BBC, if there were no fertilizers, we would have been only 4.5 billion people. The difference between 7.5 billion people and 4.5 billion people, which is 3 billion people, is only and only because of fertilizers. Now how amazing, or let me use the word sexy, is fertilizer as an invention, as against semiconductors, internet, electricity, atomic bomb, phones? Not at all. And even with hundreds of guesses, you may not have actually come to that. And the second most invented, important invention of the last 1,000 years, of the last 1,000 years, is your toilet commode. Toilet commode, the western one I'm talking about, has, you must have seen the design thing that has a kink in it, that bend. You know what the S-bend? You know what the S-bend does? Of the toilet? It always maintains certain level of water in that toilet. Have you seen that? 
all of you have seen that this morning perhaps <laughs> but it's it maintains certain level of water and that level of water traps and this has led to lives saved close to 500 million people now when i put 3 billion people and 500 million people all of a sudden these innocuous innovations start assuming a lot of weight now the idea can be very simple and hence whenever people come to you with an idea never judge an idea on the face of it always look at the impact of that idea so idea may be incremental but the outcome can be really radical so there was the piece on incrementalism so how do we judge incrementalism has to be very thoughtful the second thing is about culture if i have to reduce the aspect of innovation culture to one phrase and which is also reasonably backed up by research by Teresa Amabail, and the phrase is psychological safety. Those organizations where the leadership team puts a lot of effort in building a culture of psychological safety are only the kind of organizations where innovation is fostered. And what I mean by psychological safety is that you would not be reprimanded if an idea does not work. Now you give psychological safety to your son or daughter or your child when you ask that, okay, go ahead and climb the tree and I'll be standing right beneath the tree. Because your daughter knows you'll be standing right beneath, she would actually be brave than otherwise. And the way leaders do psychological safety is, I'll take your attention back to one of the most gigantic inventions of the Second World War called the Skunk Works. Skunk Works was the project team at Lockheed Martin in 1945 that gave us the world's first supersonic jet. And Kelly Johnson was the project manager of the Skunk Works. And Skunk Works is a metaphor for innovative teams that work under the radar. So he said that, and I'll stop there, he said that you as a leader are not supposed to give ideas. Often leaders fall for this compulsion to have high IQ and to demonstrate high IQ, which is not really required. So you're not supposed to give ideas. A leader's role is not to invent or innovate. The leader's role is to protect those who innovate. So even if your idea is not the best or you are not giving any idea whatsoever, but if you are giving the air cover to the people who are giving ideas, that's the only role that you have as a leader. So I'll put my case there. Yeah, wonderful insights. Thanks, uh, Dr. Pawan. Yeah. Um. Uh, <laughs> now, just to sum up, uh, what uh, Dr. Pawan said and Niladri said, uh, whenever innovation comes to mind in an organization, we think about a room uh, called as innovation lab, right? And uh, when somebody is given a responsibility to populate the room, they typically pick the first 2%, 3%, brightest minds, young chaps, let's put them in a room and let's get it done. Right, and uh, the the impact of of an isolated or a restricted kind of uh, environment that has on the rest 95% of the organization is just unimaginable. Uh, so, what we think has worked for us is uh, we have chaperones, right? People who uh, are uh, people who can guide, who are mentors. Uh, they are accountable, right? At the end, you know, you need to have accountability with somebody. We have accountables on that, but the responsibility at the end still lies with the masses, the employees. And what that does is, you know, you come up with products that actually work and that actually uh, sells and has an impact. So, that's just... Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful insight. I think in the interest of time, probably while I have a couple of more questions, I think we will open the floor for uh, questions from audience. So, uh, in the context of product development, typically we look at innovation or invention-led. So, invention-led is typically not happening in India to a greater extent. And a lot of things happening through market-led kind of uh, innovation. But in a market-led also, in India we are seeing a lot of copy-paste. So, we are picking up ideas from outer world where we have experienced work in the companies and then trying to make Indian-oriented uh, innovations to a certain extent which fits to India market. 
So how we are going to develop real innovation culture is what my question, because as Dr. Pawan Soni said, is that we are still not having a framework where we are giving a rewards to a failure. The entire reward system in the organization still is for the people, those who are successful are showing the results, which they are taking a normal path or the path which already been trodden by someone else. But if someone doing a different thing and he gets failure, there is no reward system for it. So how organizations are going to do that? Okay, so let me uh, introduce you to one organization called ISRO and tell you the case study of ISRO. So a couple of months back, I was invited to deliver a talk at ISRO and after the regular CISF risking, etc., uh, I was there at this uh, Vikram Sarabhai Auditorium at the outer, at the old airport road, uh, URO Satellite Center. So the first thing which I uh, d you know, saw that was, it was a 300-seater huge auditorium, Vikram Sarabhai Lab Auditorium. And right in the front row of the auditorium, we had the directors of ISRO sitting. They're not allowed phones there. And the smart thing is the people, not the phones at ISRO. So no, nobody carries a phone and their pen and notebooks were trained. So when the directors of ISRO sit on the front row with their pen and notebook trained, you send a signal to everybody else that there is no age, there is no rank and file, there is no scientific caliber that can stop you from learning. But more importantly, what my curiosity was not so much to talk, but to visit the uh, satellite center. So there I was right in front of a clean room. So imagine a clean room which is three times the size of this hall in height we pretty much can't see the ceiling and this is what we typically see in television. So on, from the crane there was this big satellite dangling. Little did I know that what the satellite is and I'll tell you shortly which satellite I'm talking about. It was wrapped with golden and silver foil and I could distinctly see a lady standing there in a lab coat. Her back was facing me. So next to me was the head of administration of ISRO who was taking me around. So one of the pet questions I have to people is attrition, uh, how many years people have been working, etc. So I just asked him that she's been here for how long? The intent of the question was she's been here for how many years? And in comes the answer, 18 hours. This lady has been standing there in front of the satellite for 18 hours. Now, I had no other question to ask in terms of salary structure, compensation and benefit, employee engagement policies, uh, picnics, and all those events, which most of the organization and the HR team do brainstorming on to little avail. Because all these questions are mood questions. So I asked him, sir, this is all fantastic, but right across the road you have another government organization called DRDO. Now if your pay scale is same, if your recruitment policy is same, if you are both government of India organization, how is it that in the same country, with the same government, with the same mandate, DRDO has failed over and over again in terms of delivering and ISRO has succeeded and even if ISRO fails like in the case of Chandrayaan 2 we seem to be learning from it and taking the success in the stride uh, the chairman did not resign by the way when Chandrayaan 2 failed right you all remember that so he smiled at me maybe because my question was stupid and then he said I work with DRDO so I can give you some insights and he gave me three insights which will possibly answer your question so first of all, what we need to understand is that innovation happens as islands. If innovation and the excellence of innovation was so easy, America by now would have gotten a second Silicon Valley. But even America hasn't gotten a second Silicon Valley. It's not so easy. The reason Silicon Valley exists in a 50 mile stretch between San Jose and San Diego is be because of some very historical events, including Hare Rama Hare Krishna mission, including the invention of condoms, the Vietnam War and a lot of things, the rock band and all of that led to the creation of Silicon Valley. It was not organic. So the point which I want to make here is he said that if we have to cultivate a scientific temperament, what we need to understand is that don't try to change the culture of your company. Try to change the climate of your team. Climate of your team. For example, I, it's raining outside by the way. It doesn't matter what's happening outside. As long as we can see the climate of this room will be comfortable. So ISRO has created a climate of excellence, scientific excellence, scientific temperament. Even the culture of the country is that of Jugad. That's the first point. The second point, he said that science means no hierarchy. If this lady is standing there and she was still unbeknownst to our conversation, our silly conversation rather, 
if this lady comes to the chairman of ISRO and says that, sir, this bolt, the pitch of the bolt should be three threads more. Otherwise, this satellite will dismantle at 36,000 kilometers. The chairman of ISRO has to listen to her. I said, this is fantastic. So science means no hierarchy. And the third thing he said is that the power distance between the point of decision making and the point of action should be limited. DRDO is headquartered in Raisina Hill, North Block, New Delhi. And ISRO is headquartered in Bangalore, Kasturi Nagar. Now, when a decision is made in Bangalore and executed in Bangalore, the power distance is low, and that's where innovation happens. So next time, when you're trying to innovate within your organization, and I am the last one to declare India as non-inventive, we are highly creative people as Indians, where we lack is discipline. And if we can be slightly more disciplined, then we can be unstoppable. And as far as the scientific invention versus innovation is concerned, I think more important than inventing is innovating, which is to marry that invention with the market reality. So I am not alerted by your concern at all. I think we are in the right sphere. The stage of evolution where we are in, in terms of scientific temperament, I think we are building that. But more importantly, instead of worrying about this country, what we need to do is to worry about our companies and our behaviors. If you can be an island of excellence like ISRO is, I think you can inspire a million people. So that's my sent on that. Hi, uh, my name is Pavitra and I'm from Susri. I'm happy that Vivek is there out there. Uh, first thing is, uh, Dr. Pavit, if I could get a signed copy of your book, <laughs> because you've been carrying it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and the question uh, here is, um, all of us have been talking about you know, sustainable innovation. What about fostering a culture of micro innovations within a company? Right, uh, because uh, COVID has seen a lot of cultural change, a lot of new problems that had to be solved. And I remember uh, one of my coffee chats with uh, the MD landed in me building a small app, which became a very famous app within uh, Swiss Re. And you know, the beautiful term my uh, manager coined was micro innovations, which is like a grassroots level innovations. So how do we foster such grassroots level innovations and you know, encourage that in a, in a large scale industry? See, I think uh, the important thing is, uh, with COVID, right, there's the death of distance. One of the things I keep maintaining is, uh, you gotta start getting comfortable getting uncomfortable, right? And it has to happen at every individual level. And, Every individual, if you have the, um, the leadership construct to be able to say, you know what, there are no timesheets anymore. You know, I think the way we used to classically work is a timesheet model, and you know, everybody has a billing code. How many of us in the COVID model is actually working seven hours or eight hours? You know, we're working at 24 hours at different spots at time. Which also means we are working, if you're a global company, you're working on a, on a, on a global range. So if there's a mechanism whereby which, you know, outside your sprints or scrum teams, you can actually co-create, co-collaborate, and do that at a fixed point level, if a company can encourage that to happen, then you have cross-pollination of what the customer is saying, cross-pollination of best practices, what is not working. And I think most companies are trying that in various ways, but frankly, I have seen that only work if it happens from within, right? The best ones are the ones where small pods or small teams take it on themselves and do it. You then recognize that, you also recognize those, the question about failure, right? If somebody has tried something and has not worked, you still put that on the mat. And then you start having a relay around the same thing. So I, I think a lot of companies are trying it, but the ones that I have seen work best are the ones that individuals then come up, and then you can put them on, on the wall of fame, and then you kind of put the relay around it. I, I also think, as since this is, we're all product managers here mostly, I think that um, you know strategic thinking, it's, that's really, really important at an individual level. And what is strategic thinking, right? It's about coming up with really simple and creative solutions to complex problems. I think it's not about coming up with complex solutions to complex problems, right? And so how do you do that? You start by being curious, like look, scanning 
the landscape for what is your market doing, what your competitors, what are your customers doing more importantly. And then getting to this place of what I call creative foresight, which is connecting the dots in interesting ways so you're coming up with transformational change that you pressure test because like as we've talked about innovation, not very successful usually. And then the third aspect is to have that rigorous execution. So you start by being curious, you create that creative foresight, and then you execute. And as Niladri said, it has to come from within. It, it can be a feature that you're strategically thinking about. It can be a product, it can be a portfolio, it can be a company. That elevation doesn't really matter. It depends on where you're at. Um, so I think, you know, uh, a lot of us as product managers, we see in our performance review, you've got to be more strategic. And what the heck does that even mean? But I think over the years, I've figured out that it's about curiosity, creative foresight, and then getting to relentless execution. Um, so it, it really is on every one of us. And I would say, you know, to, um, uh, to the gentleman there that talked about you know, what about ideas repeating or putting a new skin? I think there's absolutely no shame in borrowing ideas. Um, why reinvent the wheel, right? Uh, focus your energies on something that builds on top of that is what I would say. So, um, you know, I'm not ashamed of copying or blatantly copying ideas. It's about what you do on top of it that I think makes that difference. Okay, thank you so much. I think it was a fantastic audience and a fantastic set of speakers here. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, if I have to just kind of, you know, summarize, it is not always about those big ideas out there, but it is also about making those incremental ideas which can have a big impact, right? I think for me, that is one big key takeaway over here. And of course, uh, continue to learn from your customers. And your customers are never going to, they're just going to tell you the symptoms. It is us as product builders who need to find out what is the right solution for them. Thank you again for this fantastic panel.